Hello, and thank you for listening to the History of World War II podcast, episode 296, an interview with Brian Rigg about his book, Flamethrower, Iwo Jima Medal of Honor recipient and U.S. Marine Woody Williams, and his controversial award, Japan's Holocaust and the Pacific War. Brian Mark Rigg has a passion for history and social justice, and lives by the themes he took to heart during his time in the U.S. Marine Corps and at Yale University. Those principles were the impetus behind his decision to set up his own firm, Rig Wealth Management, in 2009. He is also the author of Hitler's Jewish Soldiers, which won the William E. Colby Award for Military History, and was featured on NBC's TV's Dateline. He is also the author of Lives of Hitler's Jewish Soldiers, Untold Tales of Men of Jewish Descent, who fought for the Third Reich, and The Rabbi Saved by Hitler's Soldiers. Mr. Rigg, thank you very much for being with us today. Hey, it's good to be here. Thanks so much, Ray. Absolutely. Now, I have to be honest with you. If this interview takes four hours, it's your own dang fault because you're the one who wrote uh, an incredibly detailed book about the second half of the Pacific War. And only then did you get to the details of the Battle of Iwo Jima. So that's my weird way of thanking you for writing this book. I enjoyed it very much. But I did want to ask on a more serious note, how did this book come about? Because even... Halfway through the book, I could tell it was a labor of love, and I just was wondering how this how this story and yourself got together. Hey, uh, yeah, thanks so much for the question, Ray. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, I, I'm a military historian with a focus on World War II, Nazi Germany, the Holocaust, uh, mm-hmm. but I'm also a former Marine Corps. You know, there's no really former. I'm a Marine Corps officer, right. and so five years ago, I decided to go to Iwo Jima for the 70th commemoration of that battle, and I wanted to just touch Mecca and uh, you know be with other Marines, and there was 30. Uh, Marine Corps veterans from that battle that were going as well. And I was taking my 12-year-old son, so I wanted him to experience that as well, American history, honor these men. And like I say, be a part of something that is very sacred to the Marine Corps. Mm -hmm. And so I I went there thinking that, you know, I've always wanted to write a book about the Pacific War in, in some form or fashion. I've written four books on World War II and the Holocaust, Uh, But I wanted to do something for American history and Marine Corps history. So I went there back in 2015. And while on this trip, I uh, met Medal of Honor recipient Woody Williams. And he's one of the biggest living legends of the Marine Corps today. And I found out that nobody had written his story. So that's what started the gestation for writing this book on the Pacific War, Japan's Holocaust, and the Medal of Honor recipient Woody Williams called Flamethrower. Mm, okay. Yeah, um, we were joking a little bit before we came on air. You're a Marine. I'm the son of a uh, Air Force uh, uh, personnel, so we both think we're better than everyone else. But I, I think we all know it's the yeah. Marines. I, I I accept that. My son is Marine, eh. so so you win that one. Oh, great! Hey, great, great. Well, well, finally you got it uh, right on the third generation. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Someone did. Yeah. So I I, want, I wanted to say to you that when um, I'm not sure if it was your publisher whoever got in touch with me, uh, I considered myself very lucky to come across your book when I did, because even though your main story is Iwo Jima and, it, and it's Woody and all his incredible exploits, because I had just gotten past the part of Pearl Harbor in my storyline, your book at the ver- at the beginning of it does talk about what's going on in America. And that was the part that I was really getting interested in. Okay, now that America's in the war, we consider ourselves sucker punched by the Japanese. How was America feeling about this? And I don't mean the military side, and I don't mean the political side. I've covered that. But uh, but the American people. And your book really helped me understand that even though we were angry at the Japanese, we were also fearful of them because these were seen as very fanatic, uh, fanatical soldiers who were willing to die for their emperor. Yeah, you bring up a lot of interesting points that as I dove into the National Archives uh, material in College Park, Maryland, Washington, D.C., as well as in the Marine Corps 
and and St. Louis where the personnel files were. I was really shocked about how much we had our heads in the sand uh, during the 30s and, and you know at the beginning of the the 40s. We were seeing all the devastation that Japan was doing all over Asia, especially the rape of Nanking mm-hmm. and and what it was doing in Manchuria. We saw obviously what Adolf Hitler was doing with the Sudetenland and Austria and Poland and then uh, you know in France. And we we weren't wanting to get involved. Now we were sending supplies to Kai Kai Shek and the Nationalist Chinese. We had the Flying Tigers mm-hmm. over in Asia. Uh, we were sending a lot of ships and supplies to England, helping them in their fight against uh, Hitler. But Americans in general did not want to get involved. You know, even though we got involved at the very end of World War One, all the horror tales about, you know, trench warfare and how a whole generation of German and English men, you know, are, were pushing up daisies in the fields on the Western Front you know, horrified the American public to such a degree that we were like, never again are we going to get involved with a European, you know, spat, let them take care of it. We're going to focus on our own issues. And granted, there was a lot of truth to that. We had just come out of a Great Depression. FDR was, you know, uh, pushing through New Deal programs to get people back to work, to get the economy back up and running, to get, you know, security laws in place so we wouldn't have a debacle on Wall Street and a bank, a run on the banks again, ever again. And so we were just trying to survive and, and, and heal our wounds from the Great Depression, and we really didn't care what uh, Hirohito's Japan and Hitler's uh, Nazi Germany were doing to people, even though we had some inkling of how bad these regimes were. Now, granted, before we got attacked, really we didn't have knowledge of the full-scale rape and pillage and destruction right. that uh, Japan was wreaking across Asia, and we didn't really understand of the Holocaust that was going on. We do, we did know there was some persecution, but uh, to get to your question, what did the attack do to the common American? Well, you had a very strong isolationist platform. Mm-hmm. I mean, Charles Lindbergh at this time, very famous American. He was, you know, in line with the Nazis and in, in speaking out against, uh, uh, you know, going to war against Germany. In fact, he was saying we should support them. And there was huge numbers of people who uh, listened to his message and liked it and supported it. I mean, mm-hmm. we had and, uh, uh, you know, in the middle uh, in Madison Square Garden in New York, at this time, we had a huge rally for Nazism. You know, yeah. it's just mind numbing to people uh, today to realize how many Americans were basically supporting uh, Hitler and uh, support and then also supporting America's isolationist move not to get involved. Now get to Japan attacking us at Pearl Harbor. It's kind of an interesting psychology of, uh, uh, of America. And this is why Churchill said the following. Says, you know, America usually does the right thing after exhausting all other options, <laughs> and yeah, you know, and right when we got our nose bloodied at Pearl Harbor, because we were doing some things against Japan, like cutting down the uh, the oil uh, mm-hmm. supply, uh, doing embargoes, punishing them economically, supporting Kai Kai Shek more with supplies. And Japan was getting ticked off, and they were like, well, we got to do something while we still have a lot of oil and gasoline, and we have the upper hand. And even though most of the planners of Pearl Harbor, you know, Yamamo- Admiral Yamamoto in particular, uh, you know, knew that there was a slight chance of real success in the long run. They felt, you know what, we're losing face so much, we got to do something before America is way too powerful to do anything against. And so when they hit us, they did the worst thing they could possibly do. They basically changed overnight Mm -hmm. all Americans in support of a war against Japan. And then Hitler did something incredibly idiotic. (laughs) When you look at what the Americans were thinking at this time when we got attacked on December 7th, 1941, they were all focused on, we got to fight the Japanese, we Mm -hmm. got to give them payback, how dare they hit us in our own country and kill our boys. And so we were all ramping up here in a few days, how are we going to get back, how are we going to defend the Pacific, how are we going to prevent invasion of California and Hawaii? And then suddenly Mussolini and Hitler, on the 11th of December, 
not having any treaty obligation. The tripartite <laughs> right. basically didn't didn't say that if another person gets attacked, like in World War One, that we have to declare war. That was only an economic agreement, and Hitler was not obligated to declare war. But the idiot declared war against America right then with Mussolini. Yeah bringing the full might of America against him. And I can't tell you how many German officers I interviewed back in the 90s. In fact, we, in fact two German generals, Maltzon mm-hmm. and Bielitz, who said, you know, as soon as they heard at their divisional headquarters that Hitler had declared war against America, they knew they were going to lose. Wow. And in many respects, Yamamoto knowing he didn't get the aircraft carriers at Pearl Harbor and knowing um and that they are awakened, you know, use the Torah, 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 a famous phrase. It's not historical, but from that movie, he says, we have awakened a sleeping giant. Yeah. That really changed the entire foundation of America to be supported by we, uh, people that are saying we are going to revenge Pearl Harbor and we are going to destroy Hirohito and Hitler. And then it's an incredible resolve that within the first year, we were out producing all three Axis powers combined: wow. uh, Italy, Japan, and and and, um, and Germany. And one 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 piece of information I love to bring out of the book to, to just kind of show uh, you know people in the world don't make us angry right. is when Japan attacked us at Pearl Harbor. They attacked us with thirty six ships. And over 300 planes. Mm-hmm. And an amazing feat. They did it without being detected, and they, you know, they sank uh, many ships, mm-hmm. you know, and killed uh, several thousand of our, our men and women. So now let's fast forward. When we go to Iwo Jima, right. we had 800 ships <sighs> and several thousand planes that we just, just attacked that island with. And when we were getting ready to invade Japan, we had over 3,000 ships and we had millions of men to deploy, something that um, Japan never had the ability to power project like we. So, you know, suddenly when we got really focused, we only had 350 ships when the war began. Mm -hmm. By the end of the war, we had 8,800 don't make us angry. And wow. so, you know, that's what, what it did to America. It galvanized us like nothing else before. Everybody had a sense of purpose. We had a common enemy, and we weren't going to back down. And the isolationist movement suddenly evaporated. It's almost like you had what we have today, Democrats and Republicans bickering and fighting over all uh, the mess we see today. Mm-hmm. And then suddenly one event makes everybody American. Right. And for the next four or five years, you really don't see a lot of problems with party. Yeah. Uh, you know, you have a little bit of a spat at the end. MacArthur thinking about going, you know, being a president and mm-hmm. fighting against Truman and so on. But no, that 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 that's not that's not going on at, at all. And of course, and I'm, I'm extending a little bit into Korea. You don't have any of that kind of bickering and uh, divisiveness that was going on uh, that's going on in America today. So that's what it really did for America at that time. It's truly remarkable in our history that something like this really brought us as an entire nation uh, 100% together. Right. Well, so that's a very long answer to your question. <laughs> no, I appreciate <laughs> Sorry about that. I appreciate it very much. So you brought up something that re- that reminded me of a one of the more uh, one of the favorite parts of your book is that, and and you make you make the point about um, okay, so you could be a farm boy in West Virginia, Kansas, Northern Texas, whatever. I don't, you know, and and Pearl Harbor comes along, <clears throat> and it's time to get revenge. It's it's time to be angry. I get all that. That makes sense. And Americans have this very pragmatic pragmatic attitude. It's like, okay, we're now in the war. What do we have to do to get it over with as fast as we can? You know, all that makes sense to me. But just because a young man who's 17, 18 years old is angry, that doesn't make him a good warrior. A soldier just makes him angry. I love that part of your book when these guys start going to uh, basic training, when they go to, uh, I'm not sure the proper term, uh, recruitment training or or uh, the training in the Marines. Everybody has to learn. Yeah, and then just boot yeah. camp. Boot camp. There we go. <clears throat> so everybody has to learn the system. Everybody has to learn a weapon. Everybody there's there's specialization in these weapons, and then they have to learn to work as a unit because that's how you project power. And so I I love the way that you conveyed these officers who were very intelligent men took these took this material that was these young men from all over the country. 
and they focused on the science of warfare. Yeah, you can be mad, but I need you to break it down into a science and, and teach it in, in its various parts. It, re, it kind of reminded me of the Romans. For the Romans, war wasn't personal. It was a business, and, and they treated it as such. And I think the American officers knew that we have to turn these guys into professional soldiers. Later on, they'll become killers because they, they're getting all worked up, but they need to be professional soldiers to try to have any chance to take on the fanatic Japanese and they did a brilliant job with that. You know, yeah, you, you, you are absolutely right. When I um, uh, was doing this research, I had a wonderful mentor. Uh, his name is Colonel John Hoffman. He's the, the famous author of the definitive work on Chesty Puller, who's basically, a, you know, obviously a legend and, and a god for the Marine Corps. Mm-hmm. And so he knew a lot uh, of the places that I needed to go for my source uh, hunting and uh, he gave me a lot of context about Marine Corps history. And one thing that he, he told me as I was going into this uh, world of the Marine Corps of World War II and how we trained our men to go fight the Japanese, he says, you know, I haven't really ever seen anything uh, uh, about boot camp training right. uh, in all the reading that I've done. So, you know, I flew out to uh, San Diego to the boot camp and I just kind of showed up since I'm a retired Marine. I was a uh, able to get, you know, access to the base. And, and they have a new museum and an archive there that's only been around for 10 years. And they took all these old files and put them in there. And nobody really looked at them before. And when I was there, I had a couple of wonderful archivists that found me a training manual from the very time that Woody Williams, the Medal of Honor guy who I document, from the very time he was there. So I basically got... Wow. Uh, hands-on material on how they were training these men, what they were teaching them, what the day was, uh, you know, organized uh, mm-hmm. around. And it was fascinating. And so, you know, to, to get people to buy into something, you got to have leaders that are willing to lead from the front, obviously. And the Marine Corps is all about that right. beautiful thing that you see going on at boot camp. You get this collective a group mentality. And I was a part of that when I went through OCS in the Marine Corps, you know, that everybody's buying in that you are becoming a Marine. And, and, and in many respects in the, the services today, you still have that. In many of the services, you just join. Right. But in the Marine Corps, you transform, you become. And mm-hmm. this identity is a total transformation of these young men's lives. And they were taught that they were the best of the best elite unit. And in many respects, they, they were, uh, you know, they're amphibious warriors. They're a unique you know, branch of the of the uh, the armed forces, mm-hmm. and by the end of you know their thirteenth thirteenth uh, week at boot camp, when they become Marines, you see this transformation of these men that they are willing to die for one another. They're willing to obey orders with without questioning. They trust their officers. They take incredible pride in the name Marine. And they are the ones that are going to go give the payback to Japan for what they did at Pearl Harbor. They're going to be the future heroes of America. And these guys, not only were they trained with fire team tactics of how to operate within groups, you know, that are four member teams, a squad, you know, 13 member teams, Mm -hmm. a platoon, 30, 30 to 45 member teams. And you go on and on. They 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 learned, you know, all these different weapons. They learned how to live in different environments and the confidence that the training gave these guys that they could adapt and improvise was truly remarkable to see what these young men went through that were coming from depression homes, you know, right. coming from, you know, really small communities, many of them small schools, some of them not even having any school education. And when you look also how they're training them educationally wise, these guys in, you know, the three months, a lot of times got more education about how to write, how to add, how to to think critically than they ever had before. And I really go into that in detail, as you you noted. And I've gotten a lot of, and I didn't think that was going to be something a lot of people really enjoyed. Mm -hmm. But the feedback I'm getting from people reading this is like, man, the transformation of young men into Marines back then, we never really knew what was involved. And that was a very interesting piece of understanding these guys' mindsets as we send them off to kill the Japanese. 
Yeah. And, and I can't remember exactly how you say it in the book, but you you said something like most of these guys couldn't find Pearl Harbor or Hawaii on a map if their life depended on it. And now they're heading out there. And now after those 13 weeks, it's the equivalent of being able to bite into metal and spit out nails. But that's exactly the type of guys that you need, warriors that you need, who are going to take on the Japanese who have a very different code. They have, they have a very different culture. And I'm not judging them. I'm just saying they had their ways about it. They that made them very impressive soldiers, and someone had to go toe to toe with them, and that was going to be the Marines. Yeah, you know, and, and, you, and you bring up an, a question that, uh, earlier that I can now answer. Uh, you know, how we view the Japanese. Mm -hmm. You know, we we really underestimated them before they attacked us at Pearl Harbor. They were little yellow men, uh, buck tooth, can't can't really see very well. Uh, you know, their their average size is basically at the size of a chimpanzee. I mean, we really were derisive of right. the Japanese and the enemy. And then suddenly, when they take over, you know, half the Pacific, and they bloody us uh, at Pearl Harbor, we actually had the opposite view. We're like, man, these guys are superhuman. They're yeah. They're uh, able to accomplish things that we never even dreamed of. So the Marines had to give them confidence that they could go meet these guys without any any trouble doing so, mm -hmm. and that they could they could uh, defeat them very quickly. And even though they were told how fanatical and brutal these Japanese soldiers were, uh, it took them weeks, if not months, of fighting these guys to really start getting it into the culture of what type of enemy we were we were facing. Mm -hmm. It's it's kind of you know the interesting thing about World War II is it's uh, emblematic of what we've had I think throughout our history, and it's remarkable that we often win our wars because we usually declare war. And then we prepare for it. You know? <laughs> right. We get we get it backwards all the time. And so that we were able to get these guys out there, get them ramped up after the war and prepare them enough to be able to take the inputs that they were getting at the time when they were fighting the Japanese and adapt to jungle warfare, island warfare, being on ships where it's remarkable what our guys were able to do. In fact, you know, I think today if we had this, a similar situation – we would be hard pressed yeah. to be able to do things like we did back then so quickly and efficiently. Yeah. And and for the guys to be able to take it, because back then that was you just you just dealt with the being on ships, going up and down, getting seasick and all this stuff. You just you you just waited until you're you were ready to, to go be sent on an island. I did want to react to one thing you said before we go on to the next question, because in your book, I lost count of the number of military maxims that you use throughout history, which I enjoyed very much. So I, what I found amazing was the transformation of the Ameri of the Marine mentality. First, we don't take the Japanese seriously. Then we think of them as supermen. And then we have to find a way to consider ourselves and prove it that we're better fi fighters than they are. So again, the officers, the Marine officers who had to guide these young men and form their uh, opinions, you just did a really good job of making that make sense. And they're like, yeah, these, these Japs are tough, but our guys are just that much tougher. And that's what yeah. was expected. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know what, they, they, they kind of uh, over-exaggerated how brutal this guy was um, to some degree during the boot camp mm -hmm. uh, phase of a lot of these guys' uh, lives, especially when they were getting veterans from Guadalcanal and so on. And the, the Japanese fighter, fighting mentality just shocked us on, on Guadalcanal. So on one side, you had a healthy dose of fear when mm -hmm. we entered. But on the other side, we, we, we basically came to learn very quickly that the Japanese – had very poor tactics, you know, with the bonsai charges, right. with the screaming, uh, wanting to die in battle, uh, that were not really conducive to efficient, small, you know, tactical engagements. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, General Cates, who later, he was the 4th Marine Division commander on Iwo Jima, he later became a commandant of the Marine Corps, he fought the Germans in World War I. Mm -hmm. And he fought the Japanese, obviously, in World War II. And he said, thank God the Japanese didn't have the technical know-how and the tactics of the uh, Germans. And thank God the, the Germans 
didn't have the fanaticism of the Japanese <laughs> or, or it would have been a different war. Right. So, you know, the, the fanaticism continually shocked us, but an acceptable kill ratio during World War II for us, for the Japanese, for the American public right. was 10 to 1. Wow. For every one of our guys, we killed 10 Japanese. If that got brought down, the American public got very upset. And even Jima was a case in point because that was brought down to one to three. Wow. And that really shocked America, shocked FDR, and was one of the reasons why they're like, man, if this is the fatality rate of uh, the Japanese soldier, which was 98%, I mean, mm -hmm. while many modern militaries scream, we're going to fight to the death, the Japanese are the only ones to prove it. Right. They did that. They Usually a Waffen-SS unit, a Wehrmacht German unit, a British ally you know, a force unit, uh, or an American unit, when they suffered 30% kills kill mm -hmm. ratio of their of their own unit and they had that and they had a, probably additional 30 percent uh wounded right. only had probably 30 percent combat effective they gave up yeah. japan never did and when they when they were killing at that ratio at iwo jima especially when they went underground as we see in clint eastwood's film you know flags of our fathers or letters from iwo jima and in my book details that uh, very uh, graphically mm -hmm. they started realizing you know what if we had this all across japan we are going to lose millions. We got to drop the bomb. So that's kind of you, you bring up an interesting uh, psychological approach that you need to have when you look at this history. You know, at the beginning of the war, I mean, right before the war, these guys are pathetic and they're they, they would be, you know, easily. Uh, right. um, uh, defeated in battle. Then the ba uh, war starts. We're like, oh my God, these guys are superhuman. Then we start fighting them and we realize, okay, they're a phenomenal foe. We can really defeat them, but God, the way they fight, yeah. we can't continue on doing this. They are, you know, uh, otherworldly and yeah. we do not want to go across Japan like we did Germany and fight these nut jobs and these religious fanatics. Exactly. Yeah, that's going to set up a lot of uh, other things once we're ready to ask the question, do we drop the bomb or do we invade the, the main islands? Um, okay, so if we could, let's get to the meat of your book. Obviously, a lot of it centers around Woody Williams, uh, his experiences. So I'm going to ask you to introduce him to us and maybe kind of use his story as an excuse to get us through some of the advances that the Americans made through the Pacific, because I know he was involved in, in various other fights before Iwo Jima. But one of the parts I really enjoyed about your book was obviously the title, Flamethrower. I, I really didn't know a lot as far as the specifics of what these guys have to do, how effective they could be, how dangerous their job was, and the fact that even though the, the flames, the flamethrowers came with manuals, a lot of these, a lot of times these guys had to figure stuff out on their own, and that just scared the heck out of me. But if you could uh, bring Woody into the story, that would be great. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So, you know, since you ended on flamethrower, I'll just describe that a little bit. So this is the title of my book. And then I'll, I'll uh, answer in full about Woody Williams and, and why it's uh, been very interesting to use his life to tell the story of the larger history of Japan's Holocaust, Pacific War, Iwo Jima and Guam. Mm -hmm. So the flamethrower, you know, I when I was a little kid, you know, you and I are basically the same age. You know, when we buy our uh, army men that we got all the time or right. battlefield and so on, we had a lot of these figures that had the flamethrower. And I always thought those guys were the worst, you know, toy, yeah. you know, plastic army men to have, have when I fought with my friends, you know, when we had our battles, at, you know, in our living rooms and whatnot. I didn't really understand the flamethrower, but, you know, obviously the men who built these toys were probably World War II vets and they didn't yes. realize how how important this weapon was, especially in the Pacific War. And so when you look at the flamethrower, I think I'm the first guy to really document how the flamethrower was brought in to the uh, uh, Marine Corps and how people trained with it. Mm -hmm. And what I found is that one third of all Japanese on Iwo Jima or in Iwo Jima, because they were in the island fighting us, and Okinawa, which many of them were in the island there, one third of all of them were incinerated by either portable carried flamethrowers or the Zippo tanks, the Sherman tanks that were Sherman uh, tank flamethrower tanks, mm -hmm. because we couldn't blow them up, we couldn't shoot them, we couldn't, you know, uh, concuss them, 
uh, with our, our naval ship guns, we had to literally pour liquid flame into their holes and incinerate them and burn them alive. Right. And you see a little bit of this in Hacksaw Ridge uh, as the flamethrower is used there. Mm-hmm. But in other words, it was a very, very important weapon in World War II. And I really focus an awful lot on it. And from what people have told me, this is one of the most educational uh, books they have on that weapon. And oh, the yes. reason why I focus on it is because Woody Williams, that he was trained as a flamethrower operator, and the deeds that he did on Iwo Jima that got him the Medal of Honor, he did with a flamethrower. So that's how the book got the title. That's what the flamethrower is all about. And now getting to Woody, who carried it, and why I use his life, uh, mm-hmm. I'll start discussing now since that that's what you wanted to, uh, me to explore. Yeah. Woody Williams is still alive. He's 96 years old. Wow. He's one of the biggest living uh, Marine Corps legends today. Uh, mm-hmm. Trump has him at rallies all the time. Uh, ESB number four ship, Expeditionary Sea Base ship number four, is just got named after uh, him. Uh, it's going on its maiden voyage to Africa and its first mission. It's basically a converted oil tanker. It has the displacement tonnage right. of two Titanics. Wow. I mean, it's a huge, huge ship. And so to have a ship named after him. Uh, in general is impressive, but sure. to have one of the most impressive ships in the Navy named after him is even you know, more noteworthy. Uh, you have hospitals being named after him. You have roads and schools. Uh, Super Bowl 52, he threw the coin out for it be- between the Eagles and the Patriots. Yeah. So the guy is a big legend. In the Marine Corps, at ceremonies, they have him all the time. And so when I met him and realized this Medal of Honor uh, recipient had never really had his story told, and he's so well known, I said to be uh, explore the Pacific War by using his life as the catalyst to explore a lot of these different issues. Mm-hmm. And um, you know, another interesting thing about him to kind of put it into context uh, for our listeners: some people don't know uh, about the Medal of Honor. I sure I would assume the vast majority of the the people because it's World War II podcast mm-hmm. have heard about it, know a little bit about it. But for those of you who don't know about it, it's the highest decoration you can get for valor in the United States military. Mm -hmm. And out of almost 700,000 Marines in World War II, only 82 got the Medal of Honor. And only 37 of them survived the act they had to do to get the medal. So to have one today, one out of 37 still alive today that survived the act uh, after World War II, 75 years later, is remarkable. And he's very astute and, and with it. So Woody... Um, he was um, uh, he was in the uh, Civilian Conservation Corps. It was a New Deal program mm-hmm. of FDR that he was in for a couple of years, and then the war breaks out. And you know what I found with Woody, unfortunately, is all along his uh, life, the stories that he's been giving to the public, and the stories he's been giving to the public for a long time. I mean, even from the '40s. Compared to what really happened, mm-hmm. there's a huge, huge gulf. I mean, a lot of Marines have problems with their sea tales. Right. You know, half of it, half of it's reality. The other half is embellishments and make believe. Uh, Woody has a lot of this uh, right. in his his biography, unfortunately. So his story is he immediately tried to uh, you know enlist with the Marine Corps. He was too short at five foot six. He had to be at least five foot eight. So he went back home, and then as soon as they lowered their standards, mm. uh, he rushed down to the Marine Corps depot, uh, recruit depot, and then he got in. Right. Well, the real history is he went back home after the war broke out from the CCC, and it seems like he didn't really want to go in the military. He did everything he could not to get drafted. Right. And as soon as he was drafted, he then decided for the Marine Corps, but wow. he stayed away for for a long time. I mean, he was well within height uh, uh, parameters to get in. Mm-hmm. He always lies about his height. He was actually five foot five, and that was enough uh, to to get in the military at that time. But only when he was drafted did he get in. Now, when he get drafted, he did pick the Marine Corps. Uh, who knows? Maybe the draft board said we need Marines and they forced him into it, but you, we we don't know. I don't have the documents there. Right. I just have the draft board bring him in sending him off. Then he goes to uh, Marine Corps Recruit Depot in San Diego, and he trains up. Mm -hmm. At this time, you're starting to get a whole bunch of veterans back from Guadalcanal, and they're educating the new crop of Marines about 
what the Japanese are all about. And now we're starting to power project all over Pacific. You know, you're starting to get Tarawa, you got Guadalcanal secured, you know, we're starting to project into the Marshalls, mm -hmm. and now we're and then we're getting to the Marianas. And by the time Woody gets trained up as a flamethrower operator and as an infantryman for, for the Marine Corps, it's time to take over the Marianas, which basically the three islands we were focusing on was Guam, Tenenin, and Saipan. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people don't know this, but Tenenin is a very important island because that's where the Enola Gay flew to right. drop the first atomic bomb and of course the second atomic bomb was dropped uh, was carried uh from Tenenin to japan as well so a very important island right. so what a lot of people what i what i found was fascinating as i studied woody's uh, life and uh, you know the two major battles he was in was the battle for guam or what's called the liberation of guam mm -hmm. and then he would jeep well, a lot of people know about Iwo Jima, uh, although all the details I found in the National Archives, half the documents, Ray, I, I was shocked by this, that I looked at in the National Archives about Iwo Jima hadn't been looked through or opened up since 1945. Wow. I was thinking to myself, I was thinking to myself, how, how is this possible? One of the most famous battles ever uh, that these um, documents from the 5th Amphibious Corps, uh, the 3rd Marine Division, the 21st Marine Regiment, the 1st uh, uh, Battalion of the 21st Marine Regiment, a lot of these files were not opened up. And how do I know they weren't opened up? Is because I found envelope upon envelopes, those very big manila envelopes, mm -hmm. that, were sta that were stapled shut. Right. And I had, to go, I, I had to go to the archivist and say, hey, can you open this up? And yeah. these are documents from... 45 and 46, which I was fascinated by. Now getting to Guam, mm -hmm. you know, like a lot of people know about Iwo Jima, but hardly anybody knows about Guam. Guam was an American territory. Right. It was taken by the Japanese in December of 1941. And the Japanese built seven concentration camps on this and put American nationals. Guam was an American territory. These people were American nationals and put them in concentration camps and killed 10% of the population. And I am convinced after looking through the war uh, crime trial files there in mm. the University of Guam's archives that almost every teenage girl and every woman on that island was raped. The right. Japanese were brutal. That was their modus operandi. And so to liberate this island, we, we face a very tough uh, uh, Takashima uh, uh, general. Mm -hmm. He was a very, very tough general, and he, he launched one of the largest bonsai attacks. Basically, if you take the two waves that he put together, you're looking at about 8,000 men that wow. we fought off in a few-hour battle uh, from the 25th to the 26th of July. I document that and what, what we had to do to, to counter that, how we liberated these camps. And it's an amazing story of American history that many people don't know. So I use Woody's life to talk about that. Mm -hmm. And then I use Woody's life to talk about uh, Iwo Jima. And another piece of evidence that I got that I thought was just absolutely fascinating is that there was this one guy that wrote an article about uh, Woody after the war. Mm -hmm. and, and he was a Marine Corps correspondent. So when I went to the National Archives, I said, do you have anything on Dick Dashiell, uh, who was a correspondent that was with Woody? He supposedly wrote this uh, article for the AP, Associated Press. Right. And um, uh, my archivist uh, contact looked around, and sure enough, he found three whole boxes wow. of uh, uh, 1,300 pages of uh, articles that encompass 366 articles of this Marine Corps correspondent's work, basically from Guam to Iwo Jima. And he was with the units. Oh. And so, and he was with Woody's unit. And so I'm able to actually look at a band of brothers uh, kind of focus mm -hmm. in the Marine Corps of World War II by looking at this guy's articles seeing what he's writing about all these men. He writes about Woody and many of the other characters in my book. Right. And then what I was able to do is I was able to go to the National Archives in St. Louis and look up these guys' personnel files. Mm. And once I found out about who they were, where they were from, and their fit reps, their fitness reports, you know, reviewing them as Marines, uh, I was able to then use some of those search engines on the Internet to find their families and then get their personal files from their uh, family archives. Uh, okay. And I and I started bringing that all together. And then, and then so you get to know these guys really well through Guam, the workup to Iwo Jima. 
And then you get to Iwo Jima and you really learn about these guys' experiences there. Now, another thing I did that uh, I don't think any historian has has been able to really do thoroughly Mm -hmm. is I got into the National Archives of of Japan Mm -hmm. and was able to look at General Kuribayashi, who was the garrison commander's. Uh, uh, the garrison commander of Iwo Jima. I was able to look at a lot of the files from his units and his his um, uh, garrison reports about what he was doing, and it was really. I have to, you know, I, I have a lot of negative things to say about Japan today and their denial of their crimes and how they whitewash history in their right. textbooks. But I have to say this. Director Sato, who was in Tokyo, and I wrote him before I came, and he said, give me all the questions you want to explore. Mm -hmm. So I sent him all the questions I needed to explore. When I got there, I was in a a room that was probably a third the size of a racquetball court, Mm -hmm. and he had a huge table with all the records behind a page that had my question on it. And those records were sitting behind each one to answer them. Wow. And he sat with... He sat with me for three days and translated the documents for me of how to answer the questions. And what I found that was fascinating is that Curry Bayashi uh, on Iwo Jima, Iwo Jima is one third the size of Manhattan. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's eight square miles. And in in eight months, Curry Bayashi was able to dig 11 miles of tunnels and (sighs) interconnect them all with 5,000 pillboxes and bunkers and reinforced cave entrances to fight us. And what he did was remarkable. He had a 22,000-man garrison and over 2,000 of them. So over 10% of the force were engineers. Oh, yeah. And so I got all the blueprints. I got all the data, how he was changing up, um, you know, the supply chain of men and men with that MOS, military occupation speciality, to get a really good feel of how he organized that island and what was waiting for us. And I think people get a really good feel of what we really were up against and what Woody was facing. You know, when we first landed our Marines, I mean, the first day we got 30,000 on the beach right. uh, there at Iwo Jima, and a Marine was dying every 50 seconds. Jeez. And, um, yeah, and it, it just was a slaughterhouse. And what these guys had to do mentally and the strength of character and the leadership to get off that beach, move forward, and take out these reinforced pillboxes mm-hmm. uh, was re- remarkable bravery. And so I use Woody's life to talk about that. And then, um, you know, after the war, after Iwo Jima uh, takes place, I talk about an awful lot about those experiences that he had on Guam and the experiences uh, that his brother Marines had on Saipan and Tinanen, Mm -hmm. where we saw a lot of the Japanese citizens on this island at the end of the battle, as we were taking over the island, they were killing themselves in mass instead of surrendering. And so the fanatical Japanese uh, soldier uh, and how he was willing to fight to the death and then seeing the civilians doing the same really played large with uh, the American um, leadership at this time. Mm -hmm. And then when we hit Iwo Jima and we get the kill ratio comes down from 10 to 1 to 3 to 1 and how many Marines were lost – there, we're thinking to ourselves, man, we can't have a Saipan, a Tenenin, a Guam, uh, an Iwo, uh, Iwo Jima uh, on Japan. And if we have to take over a landmass that's the size of California, and we've experienced you know, uh, what we already have on eight square miles of, of Iwo Jima and these other small islands of Tenenin and, and Saipan, it's going to be a bloodbath. Uh, so you see that what Woody's working up to invade Japan, we don't know if the bombs are going to work, but then when the bombs work, I put it in the context mm-hmm. of that these, these really saved Woody's life. And that's why he's talking to us today. So that's how I use Woody to kind of tell these larger stories. I get into the files of some of the generals. And this is another thing that was crazy, Ray. When yeah. I went to the St. Louis military personnel files, I found that several of the generals and the colonels that were leaders of the 1st Battalion, 21st Marine Regiment, or the 21st Marine Regiment, or the 3rd Marine Division, 
-hmm. they also hadn't been looked at. And so I really bring a whole bunch of information about these leaders, how they developed amphibious warfare for the Marine Corps, and then how they deployed those assets once they you know, developed these Marine amphibious warriors like Woody and how these guys were just battering rams once you pointed them in the right direction, and they just devastated the Imperial Japanese Army. And it makes you very proud to be an American as you read about these men. Right. And, and, I, and before we jump into Iwo Jima, because this is the one, one part of your book that you really took your time with and you really explained, and it sets up Iwo Jima, because if you don't get this, you really don't get a lot of the story. As far as Kiri Bayashi uh, uh, is concerned, could you explain to us what he did that made Iwo Jima so, um, so hard for the Marines to take? All the, it, he basically stepped out of character compared to what all the other island defenders were doing. He's like, okay, you've all done these things. None of them have worked because the Americans have taken those. I've got to make this battle here last as long as I can. And if I do my job well enough, maybe we can make the Americans bleed so much that we can start some kind of dialogue. I mean, it was it was practically impossible for him to do that, but he gave it everything he did, everything he had, and he accomplished a lot when it comes to defending his homeland. Yeah, and 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 he did accomplish he he accomplished his mission in many respects. I mean, as mm-hmm. you rightly bring up, one of his main missions was maybe if we bloody their noses so badly, right, that they they start to think, "Oh my god, if this is what it takes to take 8 square miles of Iwo Jima, what is it going to be like to take 150,000 square miles of Japan?" Right. You know, so um, he he did get us thinking that way. But instead of saying, oh, well, we're going to sue for peace or we're we're not going to fight in Japan. We're like, you know what? We're not going to invade Japan. We're just going to nuke them. Right. You know, yeah, yeah. Curry Bayashi, you've convinced us you guys are pretty good at this. We don't want to do this again. Uh, so, you know, mad goals, if you will, because, you know, his goal was to not win the war. It was to kill as many Americans before his men were dead to the mm-hmm. last man. Right. This was a very mad, crazy kind of focus of the Japanese Bushido samurai warrior culture. Uh, and it kind of backfired, if you will. Now, getting to Curry Bayashi, what made him so unique? You know, I, I, I'm the, the first guy, I think, to really focus on Curry Bayashi's entire life. And mm-hmm. he was a mass murderer from Hong Kong. He was chief of staff of the 23rd Army when it took over Hong Kong under General Sakai. Right. And there were, in just a few months of taking it over, 50,000 civilians were slaughtered. 10,000 women were raped between yeah. the ages of six years old and 90 just showing you what type of mindset these Japanese had. And then he was in charge of basically southern China's whole um, women trafficking of comfort women, using women like chattel uh, to be put in their rape brothels. So he was a horrible human being, Mm -hmm. absolutely grotesque, mass murderer. But he was a very smart tactician. Now, he made a lot of mistakes being the chief of staff of the 23rd Army. A lot of the things of amphibiously attacking the Hong Kong Island, uh, right. which he did, he was in charge of that, of attacking pillboxes on Hong Kong, which uh, his men did very poorly, of uh, getting hit by hidden positions, which the Canadians and, and Brits were very good, and Indian warriors mm-hmm. on Hong Kong Island were very good at using. He learned from that, he's like, okay, these defensive structures, uh, they, they did a number on my men. But, you know, what could they have done better to do even more to my men, he started thinking. And as he went back to Tokyo and was in charge of the Imperial Guards, and then given this mission, you are going to be uh, in charge of Japan's Alamo. Mm-hmm. You're going to Japan's Alamo. When he went there, he got all the reports uh, from Normandy that the Nazis were sending to the Imperial Japanese Army about how they defended the beaches, what worked, what didn't uh, work. He started looking at Saipan, Tenenin, and Guam's battles, what those generals did, how they did, uh, uh, what they did that was good, what was not good. And he quickly realized the defense at the beach right. was not working. And he also learned that attacking the ships was futile because he— Gave up your position, and when you don't have air superiority, 
And America can bring thousands of planes to our to the islands, which they did at Guam, to Saipan, Tinanen, mm-hmm. and Iwo Jima. I mean, thousands. I mean, here again, Japan attacked us at Pearl Harbor with 300 planes. Yeah. When we attacked them at uh, Iwo Jima, we had at any given day a few thousand planes, wow. you know, to attack. And and we're not being shot down uh, hardly at all because they can't put anything in the air. So Kiribati is like, you know what? I am not going to defend at the beach. I'm not going to attack the ships when they come uh, close by. Mm -hmm. I'm going to wait till the guys mass on the shores. They're not going to know that I'm there. And then when I feel there's sufficient critical mass of troops, enemy troops, I'm going to unleash my indirect fire. What that means is if you have direct fire, that means I can see my target and shoot it. Right. But if I know my target's two miles away and I'm, let's say, in a cave or behind a hill, but I know I can lob a shell over that hill and I know exactly where it's going to hit, mm-hmm. that's called in- indirect fire. So he had all these like rabbit holes, gopher holes, caves and so on with mortars and artillery and other uh, you know, uh, right. weapons. One, one was a rocket called a spigot mortar, 700 pound mortar that he would la- launch in indirect. So we couldn't see where they were coming from. Right. So our guys, you know, this is something that is also just kind of irritating to me. Uh, I, I love my Marines. I love my Marine leadership and what they've done throughout history. But one thing they did poorly throughout the Pacific war is that they consistently underestimated Japanese numbers. Right. And so when we were about to hit Iwo Jima, we thought they had five to 10,000 men. Mm -hmm. He had 22,000. And they thought that uh, most of them were very sick and not uh, not real combat effective and that most of them were going to be on the surface once we kind of found them in shallow trenches, maybe some camouflage huts. But they weren't like, you know, 100 feet underground like they were. Wow. So we massed we massed uh, thirty thousand guys on the beach, and then he unleashed hell, and we didn't even know where it was coming from, mm-hmm. and we didn't know uh, that the trench network was so sophisticated. Had we known it, I'm pretty convinced because uh, we all all our ships always had mustard gas uh, in their hulls, and right. in the. In the um, what FDR had done, it wasn't a treaty provision, it wasn't a Geneva Convention, it was basically an executive decision that we were only going to hit enemies that hit us first with gas with a counterattack of gas. Oh. But since Japan Japan did not ratify the Geneva Convention, they were not signers of it, we were, they were not, we were not obligated to the Japanese to maintain the Geneva Convention with them since they were not party members of it. Mm-hmm. So so we could have used gas attack on Iwo Jima, and I wish we had. And had we known how intricate the, the tunnel system was, right. we probably would have because our guys were shocked the first couple of days. As these 700-pound mortars came in, sometimes they would hit an area, and where 30 or 40 men were, they were eviscerated. Yes. They were in. They were. They just would be disappeared. You would find a foot, a torso, and a, a head. Mm-hmm. You know, four hundred feet away from each other. Um, so, that's what made him so brilliant. His use of indirect fire, his his ability to dig his troops in the in the earth so much that the preliminary naval gunfire hardly did anything. Yeah. And that his use of camouflage. I mean, the the the, the brilliant thing he did is all these pillboxes and gopher holes, if you will, that he had uh, in the island, these gopher holes and tunnels would interlock with a whole bunch of different Mm pillboxes. So you would have one pillbox firing like crazy. We would then focus a lot of our fire on it. The Japanese would know that. They would get out of that pillbox, go to another pillbox, then start firing from that one. We would change our uh, tactics after we thought we destroyed the pillbox, the, mm-hmm. the first one that was attacking us. Right. And then we focus on the second one. They would go out of the second one, go back in the first one, and then wait till we got close up to it, thinking it had been destroyed, and then attack us again from it. Right. Jeez. And we had, we had never seen that before. And then they had these weird oil drums that were uh, like gopher holes, and then they could go really deep into the ground with these ladders, like 30 feet. So we'd bomb the hell out of the area. Mm -hmm. Then when the guys were coming to take over, 
the Japanese would get in these uh, little drums. As soon as they were near a whole bunch of, mar- as soon as the Marines were near one of these gopher holes, they would pop the lid, throw five or six grenades, and then just kind of dive down thirty feet right. and disappear. Right. It was a it was a haunted house battlefield. Now you see him, now you don't. And this is what also Kuribayashi was Machiavellian and sinister. Mm -hmm. He had developed a system the first four or five days that because of all these gopher holes, uh, when we started intermixing with the Japanese and fighting and then night fell, we would then, you know, consolidate our lines, dig in and wait. And out in no man's land, so to speak, you would have hundreds of of dead Japanese and Marines, you know, interspersed with each other. Mm-hmm. Every morning for the first couple of days when the Marines would wake up, only dead Marines were out on the field. Oh. They did not know how the Japanese were taking. So they were giving this sense that the only people dying yeah. were Marines. Oh, my goodness. And, um, and, and so this whole system of how they uh, developed their tactics – and how they were fighting till till the bitter end. I mean, a lot of these guys to camouflage the pillboxes. Some of them weren't interconnected, and Kuribayashi actually sealed them from the outside. Right. These guys, once they were in their pillbox, they knew they were never getting out, and that was for camouflage and also to prevent the Marines from hitting them from a, a vulnerable year uh, rear. So Kuribayashi, as I studied his his tactics more and more, especially in the Japanese military archives. I was blown away about how calculated he was, taught his men fire discipline. This is what's remarkable. There was one little mishap that they thought the invasion was on the 17th of February, that they sunk some LSTs, Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, LCIs, landing uh, 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 craft infantry. These are guys, these are um, a support craft for the Navy frogmen who were taking out uh, a lot of the obstacles on the beaches. So right. when we landed two days later, they weren't there. The Japanese mistook that for part of the invasion. They started to attack uh, and they sank some ships. And that was the only time the fire discipline wasn't maintained. When we landed and landed our troops for the first basically hour, Ray, mm-hmm. you have thousands of Japanese watching. None of them fire. Wow. The discipline and the 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 mental for, uh, strength to, to maintain control of your troops like that is remarkable. And only when he gave the order did they open up. And all along the way, the discipline of these Japanese to be patient, even knowing that when they would attack, quite often it would lead to their death. Mm-hmm. And the, and Kuribayashi gave every Japanese soldier uh, a goal of killing ten uh, Marines before he died. And many of the tactics that uh, were employed with the, the terrain features that were utilized ensured that when the Japanese attacked in this area with using the terrain and the, and, the, and the bunkers that they had, they knew they would only last a few hours. You know, sending yeah. American boys in saying, you know, guys, we're all going to die. Yeah. Uh, there's no way out. Uh, do your best is not an American way. Usually right. we always have a way, even the Doolittle raid where a lot of them knew, hey, there's a high probability we won't be coming back. There was still a slight chance that they could get to China. You know, yeah. you always have a little bit of hope. You build that into the mission. And here it was a collective mission of 100% death and they were going to die. It was like suicide by Marine. Right. They knew they were going to die and this one also made him so fanatical that they they really, really bought into the new tactics mm-hmm. and their, their leader and to the fire discipline and no crazy bonsais. He had to he had to transform a whole generation of men, really, right. to not want to glor- glorify bonsai charges and fight at the uh, uh, um, uh, the the shore because. You know, out of the 22,000 men, 8,000 were uh, sea um, uh, troops. Mm -hmm. Some people call call them Japanese Marines. So he had to get the admiral to buy into this uh, as well, and that he was able to mold this Japanese military and then the mentality into a totally different strategy to be patient, to be methodical, don't search out death. You know, you're going to die, but make yeah. sure you kill as many before. Don't go out, you know, for your Shinto uh, death, cry a bonsai and get your, you know, eternal life, which is what was preached to them. Right. Be patient. 
make your death count. And this is what made him so remarkable and so different. And he's the most redoubtable commander we fought in, in World War II. He inflicted, in, in a major battle in the Pacific War, he inflicted more casualties on the Americans uh, than the Americans inflicted on a Japanese army. It, it was remarkable. That's incredible. Because that, that, that was one part of your book that I will never forget. Once the Marines start coming ashore and they start taking casualties, a few paragraphs would go by, and then you would update the numbers of dead wounded and to be quite frank about it just those who were gone because they were eviscerated like you said and you would do that every couple of paragraphs and i just wanted the numbers it's like it's like covid i wanted the numbers to stop growing and and they weren't because they the japanese were doing a brilliant job and you're right the marines were being a bit arrogant they were assuming they already knew how the how the battle was going to go some marine officers were already assuming it would take x amount of days and of course it goes it goes way beyond that but for the listeners, I want you to know that this book is almost 800 pages long. We are leaving a lot of informa- information undiscussed because we want you to enjoy that. But, uh, Mr. Rigg, I've got to ask you if you could give us some of the events uh, that Woody went through on February 23rd. And you do a very good job in your book of saying, you know, people's memories aren't maybe perfect because of uh, of the stress of war and all that. But from what little we do know that Woody went through that day was Absolutely incredible. If you could share some of that with us, please. Yeah. Hey, yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Ray. You know, the, the, the sad thing is, I mean, the reason why my subtitle has um, controversial in it about mm-hmm. Woody Williams and, and his Medal of Honor is because he didn't do what was initially reported for the medal uh, mm-hmm. to, to get the medal. And and he knows it and, it. and it looks like it came from self-reporting. He embellished a lot of what he did. Now, granted, I can only imagine when I was 20 years old, Yeah, if I went through 34 days of a 36-day slugfest on Iwo Jima and I just defeated one of the most tenacious, fanatical enemy that America has ever faced in any battle, mm-hmm. uh, that I would be beating my chest a lot too right. and say, man, I can't believe it. I mean – you know, one number I have is that Woody entered uh, his company C, Charlie Company, had 278 men when they hit the beach on the uh, 21st of uh, February. When they got off the island uh, at the end of March, uh, March 27, 28, mm-hmm. uh, there were 17 of them left. Uh, so, you know, so, you know, to be one of that, you know, first of all, to first be elite Marine, right. second of all, to survive two battles, third of all, to survive Iwo Jima and, and to do some heroic acts, you know, he, he really embellished an awful lot. And I think a lot of young men would have done the same thing. The unintended consequences is that his embellishments led to him getting a medal that he should not have gotten. He's the only Marine Corps a Medal of Honor recipient, I have documented from World War II that did not get the Marine Corps at the highest level, the Commandant and the Fleet Marine Force Commander uh, Roy Geiger mm-hmm. endorsement and Fleet Admiral Nimitz's endorsement. He didn't get all three of those men's endorsement, these flag officers, which most Marine uh, uh, Medal of Honor recipients did, right. because they started to see that the evidence was there. Now getting to, to – so that's why it's controversial. Right. Uh, it, I've, I've really got a lot of flack. I mean, Woody – has filed a fifth district federal lawsuit against me to try to prevent this information from getting out because he discovered that I found the truth. It's really sad. Woody is a hero. Mm-hmm. He's just a very he's a very flawed hero. Sure. Now this is what this is what he reported and bragged about doing. He said that his commander had uh, was in a shell hole, uh, had lost all his flamethrowers. Uh, operators except for Woody didn't know how to get past this incredible line of defense of a lot of bunkers. Asked him if he could uh, do something. Woody said, "I'll try." And Woody goes out there, and what Woody later brags about is that he takes out seven pillboxes with a flamethrower in four hours, and that pillbox alone, he uh, he counted twenty-one dead Japanese. He's ma- making you think, "Oh my God, if he killed." Kill twenty one in one pill box, and he took out seven. He must have killed one hundred two hundred. I mean, that guy's you know a freaking animal. Right. Um, what the evidence shows is that he probably took out three pill boxes with a flamethrower, and probably killed anywhere between eight to um, to, to sixteen Japanese, which is 
kind of a common day on Iwo Jima. I don't want to be tried about that. This right. is and Woody that took a lot of courage, but a hundred year on going on that and engage the enemy with a flamethrower on your back, you oh, know, yeah. and incinerate them with 3,500 degree heat. Um, but you know, guys are doing that all over the place. You know, hundreds of flamethrowers are being deployed every every day. You know, I've documented a lot of guys doing similar stuff and they're only getting bronze stars, silver stars, you know, uh, sometimes a Navy cross. And, and that's what I, I looked at all this evidence with the 31st commandant of the Marine Corps, Charles C. Krulak. And after he looked at it with me, he said, yeah, this is, this is a silver star action, maybe a Navy cross at best, but right. this is definitely not medal of honor, honor worthy. So what he did an awful lot of, uh, 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 good on this. And I also balanced, you know, with his saying, you know, if you look at some of the other acts that he did on the Island and had those that were documented were put in with three pillboxes, and, you know, eight dead Japanese, it might have pushed it up to, to a Navy Cross and, and maybe even a Medal of Honor. I mean, mm-hmm. we, we see how, how arbitrary the, the process is for medals in this. As, as the, another commandant that I had help uh, from, uh, the 29th Commandant of the Marine Corps, uh, Al Gray, and both these commandants, by the way, have written forewords uh, for my book and mm-hmm. endorsement. So they, they got to know it very well, and I, want, I wanted to get their kosher stamp of approval for the book. Right. Al Gray, as he's looked at this, and he knows most, most of the guys who were in, in charge of the metal process because he got in the Marine Corps in the late 40s. He, you know, he's, he's in uh, his early 90s now. Right. And he's... Yeah, and he said, Brian, your your description of how the medals were awarded during World War II is the most thorough description of medal awarding I have ever seen in the Marine Corps, Marine Corps and ever, and especially in World War II. And so I really talk about how how all these guys got the different medals. I give different case studies, and I look at Woody's actions, and that's what he did. And with Woody, you know, looking at his actions, what he did is he he did something very brave with a flamethrower and it got the attention of his officer and that his officer was alive because you can only get a Medal of Honor if your officer puts you in for it. And most officers were killed on Iwo Jima because right. they're leading from the front. Right. So they're the, fir- they're the first ones getting hit. So Woody is lucky that his uh, 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 company commander, um, Beck, was alive. And so I, I talk about this whole journey, you know, that Woody went on and how when he got back to Guam after Iwo Jima, you know, he embellishes his tales and then how the story took on a life of its own. And then before he knows it, he's be, before Truman getting the medal, the unintended consequences. Right. So it's almost a comedy of errors to some degree that he get he gets this award. What he does, you know, afterwards, you're like, oh, my God, I got this. I shouldn't have gotten it. What do I do with it? And, yeah. you know. What should I say? What should I should say? So it's also an exploration of human memory, mm-hmm. and uh, and also, quite frankly, it's like a, it's almost a borderline stolen valor because he I'm able to show he knows his bogus stories that he was given early on. Later on, were taken out of the uh, uh, citation before before it went to. Uh, Truman, all that, all the incredible information I gave you at the beginning that he was saying, seven pillboxes, 21 dead Japanese and one pillbox. So that was in the original citation all the way up until it got to Geiger and Nimitz and Vandergriff, and they realized the evidence wasn't supporting it. Right. And then all of a sudden, POTUS, President Truman, pulls the process basically through Secretary of the Navy James Forrestal away from the Marine Corps and fast tracks it because yes. President Truman wants a live, a live Medal of Honor guys to award war to celebrate his presidency mm-hmm. and to celebrate the end of the war. And suddenly he pulls it away politically, doesn't follow the mandates, pushes it through. But the one thing the chain of command had to admit is that we don't have evidence for seven pillboxes and 21 dead Japanese. So if you read Woody's citation now, it's very nuanced. He kills a lot of guys. He takes right. out a lot of positions. They had to change. It's very nuanced. And Woody knows that, and so I bring out that controversy, and it's very interesting. It's said, I think in the history of America and the history of, of the Marine Corps, I'm the only Marine uh, to be sued by a Medal of Honor recipient to prevent his story from getting to the public. Wow. Lucky yeah. me. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I, if uh, for what it's worth, and it's probably not worth very much, but when I finished the book, this was my reaction to that part of the book. And again, we are leaving a lot out, but one on February 23rd, for however many pillboxes he did, because you state in the book that the flamethrowers had like a 92% chance of dying or a very high percent a percentage, a chance of dying because of what they did. They had to get up and close and personal. And I get that. And it was almost like, okay, well, let's send a flamethrower in. 
he'll go as far as he can go, and then he's killed. Then we'll send another one in, he'll go as far as he can go, and then he's killed. But it was seen as a sacrifice that was worth it because they could, they could right before they died, hopefully take out a pillbox, which is a very big deal. I get that. And I have to say, every time you wrote in your book about a bullet bouncing off of one of Woody's gas tanks, I almost jumped out of my skin. I was expecting something horrible to happen. But anyway, my, my take on it was, on February 23rd, for whatever reason, Woody was very lucky and he survived and good for him. And then when it comes to getting the uh, the MOH, the Medal of Honor, it shouldn't have happened. But again, Truman fast-tracked it for political reasons, which were self-serving. And I get all that. Woody's not really at fault there. But again, he was just very lucky. So I think this is a, just a very lucky guy that things just kind of broke his way is it good? Is it bad? That's not for me to say, but you just get the sense that uh, things just kind of worked out for him. And um, I don't know, he'll have to deal with it in his own heart of hearts, you know, looking in the mirror each morning for what he does or does not deserve for whatever, for yeah, whatever it's you, worth. You, 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 yeah, you bring up a very, very interesting point, and, and that is, you know, anybody who who put on the uniform and went into battle uh, for us at Iwo Jima and Guam, you know, des- deserves our, our utmost respect and and um, uh, our reverence, if you will. Mm-hmm. But on the other side of this, you know, uh, the, to honor the dead, to honor the memory, uh, telling the truth about the history, and yes. keeping the integrity of the story and the integrity of the metal and what it represents is sacred as well. Absolutely. And that's one thing Woody has, has, has failed to do, unfortunately. And I, and I, I displayed that. I mean, uh, it's all too human to delete unpleasant facts about our biographies when we talk to people uh, sure. and embellish things that uh, we wish had happened that didn't necessarily happen the way they did. Uh, but when it comes to wearing that medal for all those men, which he often says he does, that never came back, and then outright uh, telling canards about, you know, some of his comrades, him being with a dead guy, uh, a comrade, and telling the family about it when he was, wasn't, uh, you know, t- talking about the pure love he had for his fiance when he was dating two women at the same time, one being married. You know, these type of things. It's just like, just be honest about it. And, and, and at this time in your life, when you're self-reflecting, say, you know what, this was, I shouldn't have done this. This is what I was thinking. And that's how you honor the integrity of the story, the integrity of the Marine Corps, the inte- integrity of the mission. Right. We love our heroes, not because they're perfect, but because of what they do with their imperfections. And to try to prevent those imperfections from coming out so we can learn from history, like Woody has done with the fifth, uh, you know, district lawsuit in West Virginia against me, disgraces the whole code of the Marine Corps, which is honor, courage, and commitment. Right. So on one side, I get exactly what you're saying. We need to honor these men, and I think I do a good job of even honoring Woody, even though mm-hmm. I've had a lot of disappointments with him and disagreements with him of giving both sides of the story. And that's one thing I try to bring out even more so: the honor of the medal, what the medal represents what the ideal of it for all these people that look to these Medal of Honor uh, recipients as our heroes. And when a person gets that medal tied around his neck, he becomes larger than life and otherworldly in many yes. respects. And books are, are, are you know, produced about them. Movies are produced about them. They're always on TV. You know, he, he was just on, you know, uh, Fallon's uh, Tonight Show just a few uh, weeks ago. He's mm-hmm. been on NBC. And, and you owe it to the men who never came back to keep the integrity of the story true so we know exactly uh, what what happened? So those were the two souls in my 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 chest that you rightly bring up. On one side, it's honoring the Marine Corps, not doing anything to soil the uh, uh, the memory of the Marine Corps and these men. And then another side is telling the truth. And it's kind of yeah. like what Thomas Jefferson said uh, about some of the issues he dealt with. You know, on one side is justice, and on the other side is self preservation. Yeah. You know, one, one side, you know, justice of the Marine Corps, just keep it all positive. My self-preservation as a historian, I got to tell the truth. I, I cannot. So that was always a struggle I had in this, and and um, you know I hope people uh, see that I did my best to to really give both sides of the uh, the argument. 
Well, I certainly think you did. And I think you did a great job. I enjoyed the book very much. And I just have to say on, on a closing note, just to mention for the listeners, again, we've left a lot out. But just to give you an idea of what the Marines, what the Americans went through on Iwo Jima, there was just over 26,000 casualties, almost 7,000 killed, just over 19,000 wounded. So again, it was it was a slugfest, um, the likes of which few have ever seen. And you're right, I think that certainly helped with the decision to uh, to drop the atomic bomb. But I certainly do recommend this book to everyone. It was an incredible read. It's almost 800 pages, but it certainly didn't feel like it. And once you, it's like a roller coaster ride. Once you get going, uh, it was just a hell of a ride to get through that. So, Mr. Rigg, thank you very much. And again, I just want to say to everybody, the book is Flamethrower, Iwo Jima Medal of Honor recipient and U.S. Marine Woody Williams and his controversial award, Japan's Holocaust and the Pacific War. Mr. Rigg, thank you very much and have a good day. Hey, thank you, Ray, for having me. All the best to you. It's spring cleaning time and I am vacuuming everything this year, even the creepy attic. Why? Because I'm a Duncan Rewards member, so I get ahead by using my rewards as fuel, and fuel it does. <laughs> and now you can get ahead too. Duncan Rewards members get a $3 medium cold brew every day all month long, like the new caramel chocolate cold brew. Not a member? Join on the Duncan app. Duncan Rewards. Save them, stack them, use them how you want. America runs on Duncan. Limit one per member per day. Additional charges and terms may apply. Participation may vary. Limited time offer.